But there's a secret I might tell you in a few minutes if we get there, uh, which I've been working on, which I think is mind-blowing, to do with consciousness LLMs and assembly theory. Professor Lee Cronin, thanks so much for rejoining me today. Really Pre great to be back. How's it going? It's pretty good. Thank you for coming back on the show. It's been a couple months. I wanted to touch base with you and talk about uh, your research and how it's progressed and dive back into some of the questions that we were discussing last time. So for those who didn't hear that conversation, Professor Lee Cronin is the Regius Chair of Chemistry in the School of Chemistry at University of Glasgow. Uh, and Lee, uh, Professor Cronin, you were elected to the Fellowship of the Royal Society of Edinburgh the Royal Society of Chemistry and appointed to the Regis Chair of Chemistry. I think last time when I introduced you, I got at least one of those things wrong. Did I get it right this time? Yeah, it's correct. Okay. I think it was Friedman fine last time. It's, it's a mouthful. Okay. Yeah. You were on Lex Friedman a handful of months ago discussing assembly theory. Since that discussion with Lex Friedman, you've progressed that research and now assembly theory to you is even more clear. So, I want to ask you about the research that you've done, the data that you've found, and, and any of the findings associated with that to understand how assembly theory has progressed and how it's become more clear. But before we do that, uh, for those who are not, who are still not aware of assembly theory, could you give an overview of what assembly theory is? Yeah, sure. I So I think an assembly theory is our attempt to quantify the amount of set assembly that's been done on objects, uh, construction, if you like. And actually, the way we're thinking about it is through evolution. So it's the amount of selection. And so what that means is like a me uh, assembly theory started off as a measurement device to say, well, look, if I take a collection of objects at random, how do I know if they're being uh, formed randomly, just by random processes, or that biology did them? And this is a way to say, you know, help understand what biology is, because lots of people get argue about what biology is when we're searching for life. So assembly theory merely, if you take a given object or collection of objects, they could be sandcastles, they could be toy motor cars, they could be jigsaw puzzles or something, and say, okay, I've got a collection of objects. First of all, how complex are these objects? And the way you would do that is you would figure out the shortest path to make the object the least number of moves being lazy as possible so once you've worked out how to make the move you then basically put that in a line and 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 do it all one by one by one and then generate the object it's almost like a a, a way of reducing the amount of effort the amount of memory and then you count the number of objects for those copies and that sounds kind of complicated but it's not so assembly theory the, the assembly equation um relates the amount of assembly a and that's a function of the complexity of the object the number of ways number of you know steps on the path to make it times the copy number of that object minus one and then you normalize all the objects and count it all up so that a then tells you if you take a scoop of stuff or for beach or on go to mars or somewhere it literally allows you to calculate how much assembly has been done on that box of stuff and so in a way it's about Assembly theory t allows you to measure the amount of selection that's gone into that box. Um, I, I Sometimes I'm able to explain it in simpler than others. But let's stop there. The amount, assembly theory measures the amount of selection that goes into that box. What does it mean, selection? So, so selection is um, the, the force, if you like, I use that word in inverted commas, that produces complexity in the universe that produces evolution and biology and technology and consciousness and all this stuff. It's kind of a continuum. And so selection is the process by which complexity is created through the molecular machines that form cells and so on. And so assembly actually measures the, select, the shadow cast by this phenomena we call evolution. And it's kind of interesting because when you measure it, you know there's something else going on. There's a machinery, cells, and all this stuff. So it's a really like uh, it's based in a kind of physical sense. So so assembly theory does a couple of things which were quite controversial, but it's very simple. It's first of all you can measure the assembly of things, but it allows you to suggest the number one selection 
occurred before biology because Darwin wrote his famous book that said that there is this, you know, the, there is evolution that occurs by natural selection, survival of the fittest. Whereas the seventy theory says, hey, that's great, that's correct, but how d- you've got all this complexity in biology, but how did you get to biology? What was the process before biology? And until semi theory, everyone just said, oh, it's random, it was by chance, it was this, that, and the other. But I thought that really there's a gap there, a mechanistic gap. And so assembly theory allows us to find the process selection and inorganic evolution that gives you complexity to get to the threshold of biology, and then biology becomes all more autonomous as you go on up. And we can unpack all of that. But it's really simple. It just allows you to measure a new thing, um, which is exciting because we're getting more and more confidence that what we're measuring is real and is useful and predictive and helps build a mechanism and a foundation for this kind of process that we're we are wondering if it occurs outside of biology. So it teaches us or gives us the input about how did biology start? It, yeah. it, it the, the information it provides can sort of predate the Darwinian theories or it provides the foundation upon which we can assert then evolution and yeah. So assembly theory provides a connection, a missing link even between physics to biology through chemistry. I really love that. So assembly theory connects physics to biology through chemistry. Why chemistry? Well, physics is cool and all, but it's not very complex, right? In the in the complex term. Now, people might say there's lots of stuff in physics, galaxies, gas stuff, and that's complex. Sure, that's complicated, but not complex. Complexity can only be made by selection. That's what at first kind of thing I will chisel in stone from assembly theory, that all complexity we find in the world is produced by process of selection and evolution. And so that's a very nice starting point for us to look at that connection. Now, why chemistry? Well, chemistry provides you this building blocks that can go combinatorial. So you have all these possibilities of all these molecules you can make and all these materials, much more combinations of molecules than there are combinations of subatomic particles, right? I think there's only like 25 particles in the particle zoo. But when you get to the, you know, 109 or so chemical elements, you can combine those in literally countless, countless ways. There are more molecules possible then there are atoms in the universe, and then some. So that means the space of possibilities to form biology is within chemistry. That The chemistry of biology is a subset of chemistry, and we have to have a mechanism to get from all these gazillions of potential molecules in life to the molecules that biology is used. And, and that's the beauty of assembly theory. It literally ha- allows us to develop the missing link between the two. What are the consequences of assembly theory if assembly we take assembly theory as fact, if assembly theory is the correct answer to 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 that part of the universe and to that part of connecting physics with biology? What is what is the consequence of that? Like what what does that tell us about reality? That's a good question. I mean, so one one point kind of kind of point of uh scientific theory cleanliness no theories are fact all theories are wrong not fact but if, if, if it's an ex, if it's a universally accepted theory the exactly. same way that say the same way that gravity is accepted exactly i'm getting there so yeah, we're on the same page so if assembly theory is hard to vary right and is predictive and provides a framework then is it going to allow us to find selection before biology is occurring and understand the mechanisms of generating kind of how the universe goes about creating the molecular machines that lead to biology furthermore so there's this kind of mystery right now where did the first cell come from mystery well assembly for assembly theory no mystery just put a load of sand in a box in a, in a in a you know and stir it for a billion years. Well, actually, about 180 million years. Add some lightning, add some CO2, add some other bits, and out will come a cell. Out. Now, will the cells be same each time? No, they are contingent. So the first thing is assembly theory tells you about the emergence of biology. Assembly theory also starts to explain how contingent 
biology is how there isn't one solution to life. That's really important, that the molecules we have in our life in biology are a compromise, a mishmash of what was available on Earth. And the third thing, the thing that we're seeing is we can apply cell assembly theory to, to biology today and look at evolution happening right now and also look at the evolution of, of um, in chemical space to invent new drugs and materials. And this is really exciting because you can take it all the way back. And that's something I was not expecting at the beginning. So there's a lots of interesting consequences there. But the one final thing I would add at this point is that assembly theory through the assembly index allows you to take molecules and measure their intrinsic complexity. Before, people might talk about some measure based on their Shannon entropy or their Boltzmann entropy, actually, for that matter, more rigorously and correctly. But entropy just tells you about the number of configurations of the, the microstate within the macrostate, which is very technical, but it's not intrinsic. You have to know something about it. You have to label it. What assembly theory allows you to do is look at a molecule at a distance using radiation, and depending on how many lines you get back, you can work out how complicated it is. And so what we've determined is the assembly index is an intrinsic measurable quantity for molecules. And that's just that just blew my mind yeah. when we finished that paper. What does that tell us about reality? What, what becomes true if assembly theory is an accepted theory? Uh, what becomes true? It becomes true that selection predates biological evolution and biological selection. It becomes true that we can follow the complexification of matter through the assembly index and molecules and use spectroscopy. So you can use what we call infrared spectroscopy, which is shining a form of light on a material and looking at number of colors it has. Or we can use mass spectroscopy to count how complex a molecule is. We can follow um, we, the evolution of, of life without using gene sequences. We can use the complexity of the molecules in the cell as a marker um, we can use it to explain how novelty is being produced. And the thing which is really on the fringe, not of the fringe of scientific reality, but the fringe of what we're capable of at the moment, there are some interesting features assembly theory is telling us about the nature of the universe and time itself, which it's not that I, I'm excited, but not comfortable. It's not that I'm uncomfortable because I'm making it up. I mean, not quite. <laughs> um, I'm excited because it's really pushing my limits of comprehension. And it seems that if these, if the theory's foundations are correct, it says something about the way the universe works that we never really thought of before. N namely, that the universe has a definite past and, a def and an undefinite future. And that, that time is asymmetrical because the universe is growing in time and this kind of this status that time is given in physics is not consistent with what we see in biology and this is kind of interesting because everything in physics in principle is predictable and everything in biology in principle is not predictable that's the problem so how is it if biology is a subset of physics you can predict physics in general but you can't predict biology that, for me, is a major category error in our naturalization of science. And that means we're missing something big about reality. And assembly theory is starting to lift the veil on that. And that's kind of exciting and extremely scary. Assembly theory is also becoming more clear. You've found more evidence or there's been further studies and data that's come out over the last few months. Can you talk about that? Yeah, and and also there's a lot of people call it controversy, right? It's so funny in science you get controversy, and the con the only controversy we've had with assembly theory, are kind of, and we'll get to the clearness because the clearness is completely different. It's kind of mundane, but not so sexy. So the controversy that people have is a lot of people didn't like it because they thought it was wrong. <laughs> a lot of people didn't like it because they said it was obvious, and they knew it already. And then a lot of people were like saying, no, 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 you've just stolen my idea. And this was the actual thing. So you had this three kind of thing saying, and, and there was one team that were saying all three. They were saying, 
simultaneously, you're wrong, it's obvious, and by the way, we did it before. And, and that just blew my mind. So that was kind of fun. So we're kind of dealing with that and working through that. And what I'm trying to say to people is like, look, if you think there's something wrong, challenge us, challenge it, ask questions, because the process of clarification is useful. And we are trying to make sure that as many people understand it as we can. But where where is it becoming more clear? Well, we're able, we now understand that we can generalize assembly theory, not just in molecules, but in networks, in materials, in emergent entities in different layers, in genes, in tissue, in, uh, in, uh, even in, uh, in language and technology and abstraction, and I hate to say the C word, and in consciousness. And, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm kind of like, oh gosh, there are so many layers here. But let's go back to the core of what assembly theory does. It has two variables. It has the object and the, the number of objects. That's all you know, all you need. So, if it's, so assembly theory even helps you understand the complexity of memes. You could take the memes and look at the number of letters and the number of configurations and look at the copy number, you know, and how that meme is competing. And, you know, if Elon Musk is tweeting one meme and everyone's reproducing it or you come up with a meme, if we in this podcast try and come up with a meme that everyone's saying and goes viral, that would be cool. That means the meme has undergone selection. And I think there's, I think it's Susan Blackmore. I always, I spoke to I her think, two weeks ago, by the way. She was the original meme yeah. architect, right? Yeah. And assembly theory explains the evolution of memes. The substrate of a meme evolution is not now atoms and molecules. It is language residing in the human brain. And anyway, so, so, that, so realizing this vast gulf was really great. But what we're trying to do at the bottom is say, look, hey, I'm a chemist. Let's bottom out the molecules. Then let's get minerals. Then let's get genes, and then let's get tissue types, and then we'll start to make the leap to kind of you know technology and language and other bits and bobs that go with it. But it's really exciting. Let's talk about what you referred to as the C word, consciousness. So, what have we learned about consciousness as it pertains to assembly theory? So, I I find the consciousness discussion super interesting. And, and I kind of fall into traps by telling people that they're wrong and this is silly and this is correct. And, and so what I want to try and do is give a much more balanced idea that might actually become useful. Um, and what I think that consciousness is, is a tool by which biology has evolved much faster. So if you think about it, let's go all the way back. You have inorganic matter. And the matter's not very good. It's, it's scrambling. The molecules are, are competing. They're undergoing replication. There is, it's very slow to build up in complexity. It's not very autonomous and it, the, and it can be erased very easily by environmental events. So the assembly of matter towards the first life form was very tenuous and very hard work because there weren't functioning cells. But what happened is that the system was able to build um a a, um, a a a a a minimal cell and that minimal cell had all the bits or some of the bits it needed to withstand the evolution and kind of start to become autonomous and terraform the planet so so you get the first kind of cell maybe virus maybe semi cell whatever and then you get life and then something happens the first magnificent change is you get this chain step to universality which David Deutsch talks about in the beginning of Infinity, actually, it was a really great way of putting it. But evolution is just doing everything. It's fantastic. But you had to make a leap then from single cells to multi cells. And we don't know how that happened and why it took so long. And then, you know, plants, animals, fungi, and so on. And you got animals. Now, before animals, the way that evolution worked, trial and error and all that, is you had to die. So you, you tested things out in populations. So one population would randomly mutate and try this thing. Other population would randomly mutate that and do that thing. If the environment would say, that's you're fit for the environment, you're not, die, live. And that would take a lot of time. You know, hours, days, months, years, eons, right? Soon as animals started to be able to see 
their predator and remember their friend being eaten and imagine what could happen. You have this very interesting thing called consciousness or what we call consciousness, self-awareness, if you like. Consciousness has a number of components. It has a memory of the past, an ability to imagine the future and, and be in the present. When all those things are added together, you can act differently in real time. So the, the combinatorial space available to you as an organism per unit time is exponentially higher than for the cell. The poor old cell is like, I'm going to split and mutate. Am I living or dead? Boom, I'm dead. Or the, or the small kind of life form that doesn't have a brain that goes, I'm going to do this, I'm dead. So consciousness allows you to massively explode your search space of things you can do to survive. So in a way, rather than me going into the consciousness debate, because assembly theory was initially designed to stop arguing about what life is. It was like, what is life? Well, it's this, it's that. And I was like, no, no, no. Let's just measure life. I might enter with my colleagues a consciousness debate, not by debating what consciousness is, Good luck with that, everyone. Have fun. Be nice to each other. But let's work out how we can measure what light consciousness is in a more objective fashion than we are doing right now. There are some attempts. I think uh, Giulio Tononi has come up with integrated information theory. And that's one. But I think applying the assembly equation to consciousness allows us to put a box around it. And we might even be able to measure something about the combinatorial space associated with consciousness. And then we can go one step further. We've got the transition to life, evolution. The assembly will go up a lot. Then the transition to consciousness, the assembly goes up a lot. But what about if we're trying to measure evidence of consciousness in AIs? Now, I, that's where I really see it having some fun, right? Really on the fringe. So, so I think consciousness, the way we've been thinking about this is not to explain it or to um, define it to start with? Can we measure it in a way that everyone finds agreeable? Because the same argument is raging in consciousness. Are LLMs conscious? You know, is Bugs Bunny in the real that was drawn by the artist conscious? You know, there's kind of this problem. I think what you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you're not concerned with getting into the debate about what is consciousness, what you're saying is that the assembly theory provides a system of measurement or a system of observation around consciousness. So we can make certain empirical observations and measurements of consciousness but without having to define like what, what it is. Is that accurate? Have I captured exactly. it? That's where okay. I think we would go. Exactly. And yeah. then we might then be at work with everybody who wants, who has a mechanism of consciousness to go, okay, now we've got a way of measuring it. Let's all agree we are measuring it. And then let's have a look. It's a bit like saying, you know, we don't know what gravity really is, right? But Newton had a pretty good go. And when you wrote down the first equation, what Newton did is he unified what was happening on earth when you dropped a stone on your foot or an apple dropped on your head and you went, oh, Eureka. And you saw the, you know, the stars moving around in the sky. Unifying those two things was amazing. What assembly theory is trying to do is unify the notion of complexity and abundance and then use that to quantify selection and say, okay, it's conscious beings can make really complicated objects. You take a, you know, a, a Jackson Pollock, you know, a Jackson Pollock when you see it, they're not identical copy number wise, but you can rephrase that a bit to say, oh, that's a Jackson Pollock, definitely. And assembly theory can be used to actually quantify the the amount of similarity and also to count plagiarism and what do we all use llms for to plagiarize to rewrite you know and then they've got this argument about what is an original idea if i use an llm to do it but there's a secret i might tell you in a few minutes if we get there uh, which i've been working on which i think is mind-blowing to do with consciousness llms and assembly theory i want to ask you what the secret is but first i want to come back to the analogy you made to isaac newton let me make sure i understand the analogy the analogy is that isaac newton didn't understand what gravity is, but he knew how to measure it. And because of that, there were real life implications and adjustments and technologies that were born out of his discovery, even though he didn't necessarily define what Einstein did about space time and, and, and how 
objects can create gravity. And I think the analogy you're making to assembly theory with consciousness is you're saying that in the same way that Newton was able to observe gravity, if assembly theory can observe consciousness and, and, and measure it, there could be perhaps, perhaps real life implications without us having to worry about strictly defining what consciousness is. Would you agree? Yeah, I, I think so. And I'm, I'm just wishing I could come up with a less hubristic analogy than Newton and gravity, right? Because I, I mean, mean, I think consciousness is at least as important as gravity. And I think sure, it's a big... Sure, but I mean, I'm, you know, and, and my collaborators are great, and maybe we're a great team, and we can say we're awesome in this. And I think also what Newton did, which was really important, is he had to build an entire new mathematical infrastructure to get to gravity. And one of the things that we're having to do with assembly theory is build an entirely new mathematical infrastructure to get to novelty that's generated in assembly theory through reformulating how time works. And that is kind of literally breaking my brain into pieces. And almost certainly, you know, it's not wrong. It just becomes hard. If you, I don't mind, I love shocking people into thinking, but if you, if you shock people into being so repulsed by your idea that they, they can't find any way to latch on, then you lose them. And what I'd love to do is like get people say, Hey, what do you think of this bit? This good or bad? Can you use it? Is it useful? And then what this bit? Good, bad, useful. And then you're like, cause if you did with Newton, he was like, you know, Galileo, Kepler and Kepler's view of the universe and Galileo, then Newton's. It was kind of like, you know, we got better, right? And with Newton, we can go to the moon. And now with Einstein, we can basically measure gravity waves. And the people in Newton's time, if you told them about space time being bent, they'd be like, what? Then what, you know, there was just, there would, there would just, it's too much in one go. So I'm, and also, um, there's lots of other people come up with other ideas. So I think us looking at the, on the edge of the assembly theory, where we're going might be good, but I think I'm reining back a little bit just to say, look, what can we measure? What does that tell us? Can we actually come up with new mechanisms? Uh, you know, and then I don't want to offend people on their view of consciousness. I think I have a a kind of view of it, but it may not be right, and it may not even be testable. But with assembly theory, let's do something that's testable because I think everyone would agree. If we had a consciousness testing machine, a measuring machine that everyone could agree objectively, then that would be a huge step forward for humanity. What do you think the real life implication would be to assembly theory being an accurate measurement for consciousness? <laughs> um, I think it would explain how the universe, how so consciousness is the, one of the pinnacles of selection. And lots of people, you know, love to think the consci that uni consciousness came first and all this stuff. And, and I'm, I'm kind of trying to avoid that argument because I don't even know what that means. I don't know what to do with that. When someone says, electrons are conscious so philip goff says this and he has a beautiful way of explaining his view on panpsychism which for me is not my cup of tea but when i listen to philip i'm like sure that's quite of a nice philosophy i understand why you're saying it but for me trying to build different explanations it 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 doesn't help me necessarily build an explanation I understand, but who am I to stop Philip exploring this idea and seeing where that takes him and where it takes the science? So my, my sincere wish is that we can start to use these measurement devices to debate. Look, we can see this thing, this phenomena, you know, is it trivial, right? For, but, but I think consciousness starts with selection and that doesn't mean that the universe is conscious i'm like no no selection produces objects that persist in time persistence is what gets to the first cell then open-ended evolution takes persistence to a whole nother level and look for humans or animals and humans we have used the need to persist to survive through selection we've generated consciousness as a tool and I think some people find it offensive when I say that consciousness is just a tool to aid your survival. They want to see something else with it. And, you know, and that's fine. But it may be that consciousness is just a wonderful um, uh, feature of being able to survive with abstraction brain, being able to imagine all this stuff and do things. What's the secret that you mentioned a few minutes ago? <laughs> Um, I think we are understanding, I'm not going to give the details here, but let me get up the scenario, which I think is fascinating. Let's just, put, so Einstein comes up with the theory of relativity, general and special, special and general. 
and he makes predictions that you know gravity waves are one of them that comes out of it the, the other thing is frame dragging if you put satellites up in orbit relativistic effects are are detectable and the and the clocks need correction and so you'd see evidence of frame and had einstein not have come up with relativity this is going to sound so arrogant. I don't mean it to be. It's like an, the best that I, I got. Have Einstein not come up, up with relativity? When we started lobbing satellites into orbits, orbit and seeing frame dropping, we'd be like, oh, what on earth's happening? They're all losing time. What the hell? And then they would be, but there would be this debate about, well, you know, there's something going on and it's okay, blah, 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 blah. And then at some point we're going to know there's frame dropping. Let me now take the analogy with consciousness and selection and novelty. Assembly theory appears to suggest the following. Once the future has happened and it becomes the present and then the past, it becomes computable. The future is intrinsically uncomputable because the universe is like this. It's just growing in time. Conventional physics says no universe is a square or a cube, block universe. No novelty, it's just all there. We're building these LLMs. LLMs, everyone's like, oh, they're novel, they're doing stuff. I think the LLMs are going to show us that we need assembly theory and, and real time because we, we are not going to generate real novelty with Gen AI. And this is becoming more and more clear. Now, I, I say that with some hesitation. So I know that many people watching this will go bananas and say, that's not true. I can do new stuff with Gen AI. But everything your Gen AI can do is predictable. Biology is unpredictable. Why is biology unpredictable? Well, it's to do with novelty and the creation of novelty in the universe in time. And I will put it in the following sense. The more contingent an object is, the more novelty it can generate. That's kind of, and the less contingent, the more it's computable. Laws of physics, low contingency, computable in the future. I can compute what things are going to do simply. The more variables you have, the more contingent you are, the less I can compute what you're going to do. And so I think that our use of LLMs and Gen AI in general will show us that they are never able to outcompete humans who are generating novelty. And why is that? And that mismatch will be the equivalent of frame dragging without special relativity and frame dragging with special relativity. LLMs without assembly theory and novelty and, uh, and LLMs and novelty generation and e using evolution in the universe. And that's, I think, the thing I've realized in the past few days. But it could be complete nonsense. Sorry. So can you restate that to make sure I caught it? So the thing you've realized in the last few days is the implication that assembly theory might have on llms and 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 well what i'm saying more concretely is that the assembly theory starts mm -hmm. to help us understand and predict how to get novelty from the universe i knew things dramatically new things whereas in llms and gen ai we're getting things that look new but they're not novel they're just reproducing so that... whereas assembly theory can create true novelty and how does that happen well, it's not happen? assembly theory that creates true novelty. It's the interaction of stuff, but at the border between the present and the future. And LLMs are trained on the past, mm -hmm. right? So I'm making this prediction now on the on the eighth of July, 2024. Let's see how this ages. Uh, and the distinction between that method and assembly theory is that assembly theory is not just relying on existing data it's not just re replicating it's it's creating novelty so i well assembly theory isn't creating novelty it's, it's quantifying where novelty is coming and allowing us then to generate systems that will then allow us to mine novelty from the future and i think it might be fun to have two types of system two oracles or no two devices a device a and device b and you come to each device and you say, I want to pay you a dollar. And I want you to do the most novel thing you can. And device A is an LLM and device B is an assembly-driven as assembly novelty mining machine. 
and then you compare the products you get out of each one and you see which one is you know which product is more voted on by a human race as being exciting and novel it's like pop music fashion the cultural developments right human beings have been doing this for thousands of years the new is what we cannot predict and LLMs and all Gen AI trained on data sets that have already been generated. What you really want is a self-replicating generative system that's surfing the wave between the present and the future. That would be fun. What would that look like? What would that mean? Or what would that produce? No idea. No idea. I know. Well, I mean, I have an idea, but that's for the next time we chat. Yeah. You keep... Uh... You keep kind of talking yourself back saying, hey, I don't want to be too arrogant, or hubris, but if it if it makes you feel better, every time I talk to you, your hair looks more and more like Einstein. So, yeah, and, well, my headband, if I put the headband well, yeah, in the pocket, right. I'm <laughs> trying to keep my head. Um, no. Einstein was a great um, uh, physicist, but he actually screwed a lot of things up. Like what? Well, his conception of time is wrong. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, relativity is correct. Mm. It's a theory of simultaneity. It's not a theory of time. And the universe, um, and this is the problem, right? This is something that people don't like to get their head around. But he wasn't wrong about it, right? He wasn't thinking about it. And there was a really great philosopher I'm reading just now called Henri Bergson, who actually challenged Einstein on his theory of relativity and time. And I, and it's kind of interesting because everyone thought Henri was wrong and Einstein won the debate. But a lot of people think that Henri won the debate. And because Henri went and said, no, this is what time really is. Time is non-negotiable. And I'm reading these books at the moment by Henri, Time and Memory, Evolution, and um, I forgot the other one. But they are amazing books because basically Henri is an assembly theorist. And I'm like, damn it, I've never had any original ideas. <laughs> it's just a reformulation of what people have already known, right? Going back to Leibniz and so on. But but the nice thing that we've done, I think, is we've written down the equation. We can measure it. We've found evidence of it in molecules, in minerals, in cells, in technology, and in memes. And if you can use assembly theory and memes, come on, we're all going to have a lot more fun. Can you explain assembly theory and memes again? Yeah, so it's, the idea is like a meme. Let's say in assembly theory, um, objects have undergone evolution, and you can look at their complexity via their assembly index. Well, memes are objects; they are comprised. They can are, they can be labeled in terms of letters and so on, and you can look at their evolution. And so, it's a it's a chunk of language, isn't it? And so, language is constant, constantly undergoing evolution. And one of the things that I'm doing with my collaborators is thinking about, and my collaborators Sarah Walker and ASU. Uh, who's got a team, and they're starting to think about the implications of assembly theory in these higher order um, 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 uh, kind of uh, substrates. Like the substrate of meme is language. The substrate are, are for, for, for assembly theory and memes is language. The substrate for assembly theory and molecules is atoms and bonds. And so it's kind of interesting making the leap between the two and seeing how we can apply them at different levels. It might be that it doesn't work out, but it looks good and, and, and it looks interesting. And if we can do it to start predicting what Elon Musk's next meme is going to be, or indeed yours, that we can have fun with the environment, we'll do it. Wow, that would be interesting. I'd be interested to see you and Susan Blackmore discuss that too. She's great. I mean, she's, she's an amazing human being, great scientist. And I think she hasn't had enough credit for what she's doing with this as well. And so, I, you know, it, it's kind of nice to be inspired. People are still alive. So I was like, I really wanted to meet Henri Bergson, but he's long dead. So, it, you know, it's quite nice to kind of have people out there, role models that are still out there doing stuff and playing with the world tentatively. Um, I like that. That's one of the reasons why I like to explain what I'm doing because I think it's interesting to be at the cutting edge, and, you know, and I'm not saying it out of any, um, like kind of got you as like that I'm willing to be wrong. I mean, all I care about is how the universe works. And, and so the only way to generate new science is to generate theories that are wrong with people and then correct them. Like assembly theory wasn't the first attempt. There were lots of failed prior attempts, but we realized we were getting deeper and it was more interesting. And the pushback we were getting from people was kind of more consistent 
against this new idea. And then once we address their points, they're like, oh, that's good. And the most important thing in assembly theory that everyone sees and is excited by is the combination of the copy number for an object with the complexity of the object. The fusion of those two things, I think, is is super valuable for um, science. Or I hope, I mean, it may not be. And how do you envision the impact of this research on the future of technology and on society? Are there any particular applications that excite you? I am uniquely unqualified to comment because when people generate stuff, they say it's going to do this. But I'll tell you what I want to use it for. And I can't imagine what I'd love to use it for drug discovery. I'd love to use it to think about how the environment on Earth is going to change as a function of time to anticipate ecological issues so we can perhaps remediate problems before they have even happened or make decisions about certain futures. It's almost like a assembly theory-based minority report, right? Like the movie where you're like, this crime is going to happen here. We should do that. And, and maybe it allows us to think about counterfactuals and generating our reality and also give humans some comfort about what they're doing, right? Because, you know, we have this kind of, everyone's like, there's this ecological catastrophe coming. It's like, no, it's not. There's going to be problems. We need to anticipate them and fix them. And I'm, you know, and I'm, that's what I think is a very exciting. And perhaps if assembly theory can increase the robustness of human society and technology and life on earth to survive for longer because we can anticipate the problems, then that's great. We become, we, you know, you want to make life in the universe immortal for as long as possible. My final question is how would you use assembly theory to describe how a star is born? <laughs> how would I use? I probably is that not one of the the, the points of assembly theory is to demonstrate. No, so no, I mean I would make an analogy with the origin of life. The thing about stars is um, stars are. I, I I would discuss it to to make an analogy. Stars are very simple things. So there are only a few parameters with a star, right? There is the the composition of gas that goes in, the amount of gas. So, you know, if you assume it's mainly hydrogen, that all stars start with hydrogen, let's say. So then is how much hydrogen goes in and then how big is the star? So the star, I guess, and I'm no astrophysicist, but I'm, my guessing is the way a star forms is all this hydrogen collapses in. Gravity pulls more and more and more hydrogen. There's more and more hydrogen coming. The gravity gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And then at some point it gets so hot, it ignites. And the explosion to push the star out is offset by the force of gravity keeping the star together. And this equilibrium gives you a viable star. And that star then is the, what the star is rotating. It's burning at a certain rate. It has a certain surface area and it has a certain temperature. So there's not that many variables associated with a star. Um, but we see lots of stars in the universe coming into life and dying all the time. Assembly theory is built to say, what is the origin of life and how do we make new life? But we only have one example of life and that's on Earth. And so the analogy I kind of look at to say, oh, is if you imagine that you couldn't see any other stars in the sky, you would obsess about the origin of the sun and how to basically think about that. I'm using in the analogy of assembly theory, I think we're obsessing about the origin of life on Earth because we don't know any life elsewhere. What assembly theory uniquely says is there's going to be life everywhere in the universe where there's selection going on. The only control is the amount of stuff to generate enough contingency to generate molecular and material memories. Because if you can't generate those and store them um, in some kind of physiochemical process, of um, you're not going to get the complexity required to climb up to open-ended evolution. And I'm really wondering how common is life in the universe we are definitely not the only life forms in the universe although i have no data for that other than what i think assembly theory is telling us but maybe in the next couple of years in a lab i'll be able to point to very strong indications that indeed we can make or get on the road to alternative chemistries for biology in the lab without you know, with an entirely naturalistic explanation, that's kind of one of my goals in life would be to generate a new lineage of biology or at least show how that could form. I'm not sure we have enough time to get there, but I think showing people how that could happen plausibly would be really exciting. That would be amazing. And I hope to reconnect with you as you 
continue to gather more data in that direction. So Lee Cronin, thanks so much for your time. Let me end the recording and then perhaps you and I could spend just a couple minutes. Sure. Um,